Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my
comfort ye, comfort ye my people, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Shalom, shalom. Welcome back to the channel, you guys. Give me just a, a second to get this set. Shalom. I wanted to get a video out to you by Saturday, you guys, but um, I was working with beads all day Friday and they tore me up. I had a little bit of bee fever Saturday morning, so I was sweating and running a fever. Got stung in the head several times, one under my eye right there. Swelling's gone down, swelling's gone down in my hand, so I'm a little better today and now I can get something out. Because I'm under time constraints and I couldn't get my actual teaching that I wanted to do on Shavuot, I come across Matthew Jensen putting out another um, on Pentecost, and it's a superb teaching, you guys. So I'm going to mirror it in this video and present that to you today. Um, he's just print, uh, posted this a couple of days ago, but it is superb. And it brings another witness to this, as I was uh, attempting to do in my uh, The Secret of the Weed and the Wine video. It's two witnesses that place Shavuot in the summertime. Here's Matthew Jensen with a, like I said, an excellent presentation on when uh, Pentecost has fully come. And I'm going to tag along in this video with you because he, he misspeaks a couple of times in this video. It's not serious. Not, I think it's, um, he misspeaks. He um, may be misinformed. But overall, it's a superb teaching. So let's get right into that. And again, I'm going to ride along with you. And when there is a discrepancy in his present presentation, I'm going to interject at that point and point out um, um, how I understand it. So hang tight. Let me get that started for you. And we will go from there, you guys. Excellent presentation. You got to stay for this. Leviticus chapter 23, beginning at verse 9. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf an he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto Yahweh. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto Yahweh for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hymn. And you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number fifty days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahweh. And Yahweh bless his word to our hearts today. We're going to make this the last part in our study on the Feast of Weeks, which in Hebrew is Shavuot, and in Greek is Pentecost. Once again, Shavuot deals with the Hebrew weeks. Pentecost is, stems from the Greek word pente, which means five or fifty. That's Pentecost. What we're going to do is just jump right in where we left off in the last sermon. Exhibit E, we went through A, B, C, D, and now we're at E, so it's the fifth one, is going to be Nehemiah 13, verse 15, and Joel chapter 2, verses 23 through 24. Let's look first at Nehemiah 13, verse 15. I'm reading out of the King James Version. It says this, In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and ladding donkeys, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. The reason I bring up this text is twofold. 
I want you to first see that the text speaks of Israel, the Israelites, bringing in sheaves. And we should remember that the... I just want to mention right here, just so there's no confusion, because we are waving sheaves at the barley harvest during Passover, do not confuse the bringing in the sheaves in Nehemiah when it's talking about wine and grapes and figs as barley. Barley is not harvested in the summertime. It's done by Shavuot. It's completed. So at Shavuot time, the sheaves that are bringing in to be threshed are wheat. So let's just right off the bat get that clear. The Feast of Pentecost is one in which the first fruits of the wheat harvest is offered to the Almighty. Uh, we read in Leviticus 23, 9 through 11 about how the priest waves the sheaf of the first fruits of the what? The barley. Okay, that's at Passover time, the morrow after the Sabbath. And then we see in Leviticus 23, 15 through 17 about another first fruit offering. That's the first fruit of the wheat harvest. Barley is harvested in the spring, wheat is harvested in the summer. In Nehemiah 13, verse 15... It and it's not sheaves that we are waving at this time. These sheaves that are bring, being brought in are being threshed, and it's being uh, processed and milled into flour, which will be made into loaves, which is what we are waving at that point. So if you didn't wave any loaves at Pentecost, you did it wrong. It's not about just observing the day the way you want to or the way that Christians do, but what does Leviticus 23 really say? Okay, so let's be really clear here. We're not waving sheaves, we're waving loaves, and to get to loaves, you have to get a crop that is completely ready to be harvested and, or, or part of it's ready to be harvested and made into flour. So let's be clear. It speaks of bringing in sheaves, which is a reference to freshly harvested grain. Uh, you've heard the old song, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. That's a natural song, obviously, about harvesting wheat. It's a spiritual song about the sheaves of souls, you know, the harvest of, of man, the harvest of people, okay? And by the way, this is what Yeshua was citing in John 4 when he says, don't you say that there's still four months until harvest? And then they look over to the field and it looks like grass. They clearly understand he's not talking about the wheat, but what does wheat represent in the Bible? It represents people. He's talking about the people at that point and making an absur uh, absurd observation of the wheat field that takes four months to grow. Okay. That song speaks about being joyful about the grain harvest and the spiritual understanding would be being joyful about the harvest of souls. So the significance to this is that at the time of bringing in these sheaves, there were also those in Judah that were treading the wine presses. Now, they were doing it in Nehemiah 13, 15 on the Sabbath day. What does the law say? Even in harvest time, you shall rest, right, on the Sabbath. So what they were doing should not be done on the Sabbath, and we go on in Nehemiah, and you can find where Nehemiah got very upset and rebuked them and told them, don't do this on the Sabbath day. This is against Yahweh's law. It was a time of restoration, uh, restoring the law to the kingdom of, of Israel, specifically the house of Judah there as they came back from the Babylonian captivity. Uh, but the point I want to make is what was taking place. I know it was wrong to do this on the Sabbath, but what was taking place was not only the bringing in of the sheaves, which is a reference to beginning a harvest, but also to treading wine presses. Now, treading wine presses was the old way to get juice from grapes to make wine. They still use this old method in some places in the world, where that when the grapes are harvested, you have some women or men that are in there barefooted with their pant legs hiked up, stomping out, the grapes. My wife likes to watch I Love Lucy, and I think about the Lucy where she's stomping out the grapes, you know, and trying to act like she knows what she's doing. And we read about a wine press in Lamentations 1, verse 15. And this is what we read Yahweh hath trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me. He hath called an assembly against me to crush my young men. 
Yahweh hath trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, as in a winepress. Lamentations 1.15. So Yahweh's speaking spiritual here in the book of Lamentations, but you see the connection? He's trodden something under his foot, just like people do in a winepress. It says in Isaiah 5, 1 and 2, Now will I sing to my well-beloved the song of my beloved touching his vineyard. That's the area where you grow the grapes. Uh, my well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof, planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a winepress therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. So we go back to Nehemiah 13, 15. Let's read it again. In those days saw I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading donkeys as also wine, grapes, and figs and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day and I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. The point is that a wine press a wine press was used at the beginning of the grape harvest in order to remove the juice from the grapes to make wine. And in Nehemiah 13, the Israelites were not only treading the wine presses, but they were also bringing in the sheaves. And the only way that this could be possible was if the wheat harvest being spoken of in Nehemiah 13 was late in the fourth month, scriptural month, or early in the fifth month. See, in the land of Israel, the grapes, or the grape harvest, is just not taking place early in the third month. It doesn't happen. You do not have people treading wine presses in the first week of the third month, where traditionally people celebrate the day of Pentecost. Or the this is why it's important to bring this second witness. Because I can get where people will dispute and argue about the, the growth cycle of wheat until they're blue in the face, not knowing that they're completely wrong. But you cannot argue with a second witness. Let a thing be established with two or more witnesses. Let this be established in your heart, you guys, that it is impossible to have both wine and grapes in the third month at Pentecost time on the Christian and some Hebrew calendars. It has to be in the summer when this is all taking place. Again, take into consideration this second witness, you guys. That's the importance of the wine. The Feast of Week, Shavuot. But late in the fourth month, what we talked about on Sabbath, late in the fourth month, you have wine in the presses, and you also, obviously, in Nehemiah 13, you have the wheat being brought in. So, Early third month on the scriptural calendar this particular year that we're in would have been the end of May, beginning of June on the Gregorian calendar. The grape harvest, which, mind you, is an annual harvest once you put the grape vines up, right? It's not something you replant every year like you would wheat. It's something that comes back every year, all right? The grape harvest doesn't begin in Jerusalem, Israel, until late July. You hear what he said? The grapes come back every year at the same time. You know why? Because everything has a season. And it knows when to flower. It knows when to produce. Just like the wheat. You can plant the wheat earlier and get an earlier harvest. It doesn't work that way. He does mention something that about that here in a minute. Um, but that is not the way wheat is planted and harvested. You can't just alter your planting seasons to get a harvest season when you want it. It's in its season. Or early August. Not May, June, end of May, beginning of June, but late July, early August. So what this shows is that late in the fourth month, the late fourth month reckoning of Pentecost does have a wheat harvest taking place when it is kept. Uh, this type of wheat is planted early in the spring, and according to the USDA, the uh, Department of Agriculture, it's harvested late in the summer in approximately 100 to 120 days. Okay, this is one of the places where he misspeaks right here. If you think about what he just said, it takes 120 days to get wheat. It's planted in the spring. If it's harvested in late summer, that's more than 120 days. It's winter wheat that's harvested at 240 days in late summer. Spring wheat is harvested early 
It's the first wheat in the two types that are harvested in the summer. It's early summer. It only takes four months. So at the time that Yeshua and John uh, is talking about the harvest, is still four months to come. It's right at Passover. And in my last video, we established that because he's at the wedding. And the wedding is like 10 days when he turns the, wine to, uh, the water to wine, new wine. It's right at the last of the season, right? At, we're coming into the new year at Passover time. So how is there any um, new wine at the end of the year? It's impossible. But, so this is part of the miracle. It's not just that Yeshua turned water to wine. The other part of that miracle, it even because his miracles are, are multifaceted, you understand. It wasn't just that he turned water to wine, but also that it was the best wine, the sweet wine, the new wine. That was also the miracle. When does this happen? You see it again in Acts 2. Okay. Now, there does exist another type of wheat called winter wheat that's planted late fall, early winter, and is harvested early spring. That is incorrect. That's incorrect. Winter wheat, you can Google it. Ask Siri, how long does it take to grow winter wheat? It's 240 days, exactly twice as long as the spring wheat. I love my brother, and I humbly, humbly submit that it's very possible that he's misspeaking or he's misinformed here. It is, in fact, spring wheat that's harvested early summer and winter wheat that is harvested late summer. Okay, that's winter wheat, what it's called. This wheat that Nehemiah 13 is talking about is called spring wheat. It's planted early spring, and it's harvested in the summer, mid to late summer. That has to be the wheat that Nehemiah 13... Again, it's not harvested in late summer. That would be more than four months, brother. It's 120 days. So at, at right before Passover time, it's being planted. So early spring... And then early summer is when it's harvested. It's only four months. And it is, in fact, the grain that Yeshua was talking about. He's talking about because when they were bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing bringing in the sheaves. Remember, they were also treading wine presses. The beginning of the grape harvest had taken place. So there does exist a wheat that is planted in the fall and harvested in the spring, but that is certainly not the wheat that Nehemiah 13 is referencing. So we have a wheat harvest taking place at the same time that Aaron proclaimed the Chag, the feast. That's the bottom line. It's irrelevant that he makes a mistake on which kind of wheat it is. Um, Chris did the same thing, calling it su summer wheat. There's no such thing as summer wheat. No such thing as summer wheat. It's spring and winter, and they're both harvested in the summer. East in Exodus 32, 5, the same time the 3,000 souls were destroyed, Right, the same time at the end of the 40-day fast of Moses, we have a wheat harvest taking place according to the scriptures at that time. Joel 2, 23 through 24 is the other scripture in this exhibit that we're in right now. It says this, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in Yahweh your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month, and the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. Guys, I just want to take a second. Well, we're going to pause from that. I want to take you over to the threshing floor in Nazareth about five years ago. This is a random video I put in, threshing floors of ancient Israel. Pulled up the first video, but, you know, I don't have a dog in, in this fight, right? It, 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 this this guy's independent of me. But look at the date. Look at the date here. August 24th, 2017. August. And it's the threshing floor. Okay, so, so you don't see any videos of the threshing floor in May. None. Just wanted to add this caveat, you guys. Um, Len, let's get back to the teaching. Because it parallels the text in Nehemiah 13. In this regard, we have number one, floors full of wheat, that's threshing floors. Anybody remember when I taught through the book of Ruth, I talked about the whole wheat harvest there, mentions the barley and the wheat. It was the threshing floor where they would beat out the grain and then they would have these fans or at least two openings where wind would blow through and it would blow away the chaff because it was lighter than the wheat. The wheat would fall, the chaff would blow out. That's the threshing floor. This once again, comes right after you bring the sheaves in. 
So it's the beginning of a harvest. And in Joel 2, we have floors, threshing floors, full of wheat. And then we have two vats, that is the trough, into which the juice drains when you press the grapes there with your feet. We have them overflowing with wine and oil. Now, this is just not possible early in the third scriptural month when most feast keepers celebrate Pentecost. Why is that? Well, it is true that you could have a spring wheat harvest if you planted wheat in the fall, but there's no... That is incorrect. You cannot alter the planting season just to get an earlier crop. That's not going to happen. The only way it can happen, guys, and it does happen in the world today, it's GMO. If you are seeing anybody harvesting wheat in the third month, and it's only taken three months to get to a harvest, I guarantee you it's a GMO grain. There's no way around it. No way around it. It's not biblical grain. No way that you would also have at that time vats overflowing with wine and with oil. This wheat that the floors are full of must be referencing wheat planted early spring and harvested late in the summer. Just a quick note on a little bit of the explanation of Joel chapter 2 here. The former and the latter rain actually refers to the autumn rain. If you look up the word former, that's the autumn, the fall rain. But the latter rain is the spring rain. And when it says in the KJV, the first month, this rain will come in the first month, uh, the word month is italicized, meaning it's not in the Hebrew, and that's probably not the best way to translate that Hebrew word. The Hebrew word there is barishon. The Holman Bible translates it as before, or it's possible that you could translate it at the chief time. The first, the word first can mean at the chief time. In other words, this rain's going to fall exactly when you need it to fall. And the whole text, if you read in Joel chapter 2, the whole text is that Yahweh is telling the people of Israel, His people, look, you're coming out of being cursed and you're coming into being blessed. You can read that in your study time. Joel chapter 2, that's what the whole chapter's about. And you're going to get the rain at the chief time. Okay? The floors are going to be full of wheat and the vats are going to overflow with wine and oil. Only possible late in the fourth month. Only possible. Now, I want you to take notice that this is all just before Joel 2, 28 through 32. What we just read is Joel 2, 23 through 24. And obviously that comes before verses 28 through 32. Does anybody know what Joel 2, 28 through 32 is talking about? Well, it is quoted by the Apostle Peter in Acts chapter 2 when he's preaching when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Remember in Acts 2.16, he said, this is that, what's happening right now, this is what's spoken by the prophet Joel. That's very significant. The prophet Joel just talked about the wheat, the grapes, and then he goes in, it shall come to pass in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit. When? On the feast day. Acts chapter 2. Let's go from here to exhibit F. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 13 and 15. In Acts 2 verse 13 we read this, Others mocking said these men are full of new wine. Verse 15 says, Peter says, For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Let me give you a little background here. What's taking place in Acts 2 is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We see the apostles and possibly some of the other brothers and sisters with them being baptized in the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak in languages that they had never learned. Extremely miraculous. And I'm not just talking about one language that they never learned, but there appeared unto them as of cloven tongues of fire. And cloven means they go out in many different directions. See? In other words, there was many people, many languages represented on the feast day. Judahites that come from different locations. So they speak different languages and they even speak different dialects. And it wasn't just that the apostles received the gift to speak in their own language, the other people's language. They actually received the gift to speak in their own dialect too. Meaning like something that we can understand, I speak with a southern accent. I have a southern draw when I, when I talk. Somebody in the north, you know, up in Michigan where we just got back from, they speak with a northern accent. 
Well, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, this gift of languages that was miraculous, would enable you not just to be able to speak in a language you didn't know, but also to speak that language in the dialect which it would originally be spoken in. Could you imagine? And so what happened was there were some people that heard the noise and they said, the men that are doing this are drunk with new wine. And Peter said, no, they're not drunk like you think because it's the third hour of the day. What does he mean by that in Acts 2.15? The Israelite men, they did not wake up and start drinking alcohol. What does the Bible say about the man that rises up and hits the bottle? Woe unto that man that rises up early to be intoxicated with his wine or his beer, right? Generally, when people wake up and the first thing they got to have is, is a beer or some wine, that usually means that they're a drunkard. I used to work with some people like that, right? They would go into convulsions if they weren't drinking rather than if they were. And it's because they were so full of alcohol. Well, Peter says, look, we don't drink this early in the morning. That's how drunkards do. Okay, Generally, people in Israel would drink wine later on in the evenings in moderation when it was time to relax, go to bed, things like that. All right, so, Actually, it starts around lunchtime. <laughs> it's, it's not late in the evening. That's a, that's a, a modern thing. Uh, in ancient times, all around the world, wine was drunk throughout the day, and it was because water was bad. Water, they didn't understand about parasites and stuff, but they did understand that wine had a medicinal properties and it was good for your gut. Now, here's the other thing that's really cool about this particular um, part of the scriptures. And what I brought up in my last video about the secret of the wine is it's only possible to have new wine at a certain time. It's 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 only at a certain it's at the beginning of the wine or the, or the grape harvest. And as it's being processed. It's immediately being being drank. They they didn't wait for it like connoisseurs today for it to age. It was needed, and, and they were immediately drinking it. So they were drinking it as it was fermenting. So it'd be like a bubbly wine, right? What do you, what do you call a bubbly wine? Sort of like a Seagram's cooler, right? Where it's kind of bubbly and carbonated a little bit. It's because the wine and the gases, um, uh, the gases in the in the fermentation process. As the sugar is being burned and turned into alcohol, it still holds its, it has a very sweet flavor. And by the way, guys, this is the, the smoothest wine. This is the one they say that it's the best because it goes down so easy. And it's really easy to get intoxicated, even though the alcohol content is very low. He misspeaks in just a moment and says it's a very high, but that's not the case. It's a very low alcohol content and it's very sweet and people tend to drink more of it. When it's a high concentration of alcohol and more of a bitter aftertones to it, you tend to drink less. Does that make sense? So he has it backwards when he brings that in. And that's just another trivial uh, point that he, he, he misspoke on. Peter gives a rebuttal. These men are not drunk. These are men of Israel. These are, these are Judahite men. You know better than that. So how much sense, though, think about this. Remember, it's the day of Pentecost, right? Acts 2.1. It had fully come. How much sense would it make for these people that made the accusation to make it if it was not naturally possible? That's exactly my point. And by the way, I appreciate Matthew pointing this out because uh, he did this video in, in 2012 originally. I didn't learn this information from, from, from him. But the information came to me through him as a second witness. The, the, the fact that they're, talk, that they're being accused of drinking new wine and being drunk on it must mean they were in the time period of new wine because it would be, you know, what's the point in uh, accusing them of being drunk on new wine if it wasn't even possible? You, you'd sound foolish making that statement to someone, right? So it's clearly in the time of, of the new wine, right? And that is in a specific point. It's not in the third month. It's, it's latent. In the fourth month, it's actually the the new moon of the fourth month going into the fifth month that this period is. In other words, in the third month, Sivan, the month of Sivan, the first week of the third month, there is no new wine in Jerusalem. No new wine. The great vintage has not even begun. The great vintage, the early vintage, there's an early vintage, as Brother Arnold has taught me, 
early vintage and there's a late vintage. The early vintage of the grapes in Jerusalem, Israel, what we would think of in the Gregorian calendar, late July, August, the late vintage, September, maybe pushing into October, over into tabernacles, things like that. Okay. So tell me, how was there new wine in the upper room if it's only 50 days in a third month? You got a problem there. But there's no great, there's no new wine, no grape harvest at all early in the third month. How much sense would it make for these men to say they're drunk on new wine if it wasn't possible for them to be drunk on new wine? Now, I want you to notice Adam Clark's commentary on Acts 2.13. He says this, these men are... Now, this is really interesting how he brings this. This is another witness that I didn't even, I didn't even consider. But he's bringing someone who's trying to reconcile it from the other end. And notice what he ha what happens here on, on his methodology and what he actually proves. Full of new wine. He says, quote, rather sweet wine for glucose. And glucose is the Greek word for new wine. Cannot you also know that glucose means sugar in English, right? Yeah. New wine has sugar in it, and it's still burning off and, and turning into alcohol. So it's sweet much like a wine cooler from Seagram's. A little bubbly because it's still fermenting. I not mean the, the must, as there could be none in Judea so early as Pentecost, end of quote. Adam Clark is saying, look, Pentecost, because he's got in his mind that it's early in the third month, right? He's saying, well, this must be a mistranslation. This must mean something else besides new wine because there's no new wine. So the guy, because he believes that wheat is harvested in the third month, believes there's a mistranslation in Acts 2 because it's impossible to have wine in the third month, new wine. So you see how he's coming from the other end? So that's technically a third witness, unbeknownst to me, that's proving the same point, you guys. You cannot have it in the third month. There's something going on here. And instead of getting caught up in your ego and your pride and letting that be where you are, humility goes, goes many miles in this, you guys. I had to do the same thing when I realized that I was teaching a preacher of rapture that was not biblical, you guys. You know how, how much it took for me to let go of my ego and my pride and come on YouTube and admit to you that I was wrong. But there are some teachers out there who will refuse to do that even when you present a case that's rock solid in any court. And all they can say is, oh, we don't debate, we declare. The reason they say that is because they can't debate. They're afraid to debate. They're afraid to abate because they can't. They cannot get around the scriptures. That early, as early as Pentecost, when I think it's kept, Adam Clark is saying, it's not possible. Notice John Gill's comments on Acts 2.13. These men are full of new wine. He says, quote, the Syriac version adds, and are drunk. A very foolish and impertinent cavil this. There was at that time of the year no new wine, just pressed or in the vat, end of quote. So John Gill says, look, this was a very foolish accusation for these men to make because there's no new wine early in the third month. Now, do you think that those men were making a foolish accusation? If they were, think about this, children, if they were. Why would Peter not tell them, look, these men are not drunk on new wine, as you suppose, because there's no new wine here. But he doesn't say that, does he? He doesn't say, he doesn't deny that it's not possible. He says these men are not drunk, as you suppose, because it's only 9 a.m., as we would call it. It's too early. So P Peter was basically admitting, there is new wine, but we ain't drinking it this morning at 9 o'clock. That's basically what he's saying. That's what I mean by the secret of the wine and the secret of the wheat. If you read between the lines, if you look at the contextual order and what is going on, and then think about it, research, do some research. We've lost agriculture, you guys. This is why it's a problem today. People don't understand the growth cycle of these grains. They, th they think they can just plant it at any time they want to and get it when they want. That's not, the Bible says everything is in a season. Even the rain comes in its season. 
Want to know why you got rain in Arizona? Because it's called monsoon season. Want to know why some years are heavier than others, like this year coming? Because El Nino and La Nino, it's the oscillation of, of the water in the ocean. So, so don't fool yourself to think that it's, it's a blessing that you're getting heavy amounts of rains. It's actually look at the pattern over, the, over years and years. It's actually a pattern because it comes in a season. Even El Nino and La Nina has seasons. If it was not possible for there to be new wine at that time, he could have simply said, you guys are foolish. You know better. The grapes have not even ripened yet. Nobody's treading wine presses at this time. You see my point? Does it make any sense? Let's move on. Let's go to the word glucose, because some people debate the meaning of the word. This particular definition is taken from Strong's Concordance. He says it's akin to 1099. It's number 1098 in Strong's. Sweet wine, i.e. properly, must, fresh juice, but used of the more saccharine, and therefore highly inebriating. Highly inebriating, not because of the alcohol content. This is where we, we need to make an understanding here. It's not highly inebriating because it's high alcohol and they just get drunk. No, it's 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 low alcohol, but you can drink a lot of it and, and get carried away. And before you know it, you are inebriated because it's so smooth. Okay. How many drink drink alcohol or beer before and, and it the day you can't get past the taste? But if it tastes sweet, and I know I know some people out there that that's the only alcohol they'll drink is something sweet because they don't like the bitter taste. And they usually get really drunk on that because you don't have a boundary somewhere. <laughs> you, you forget what you're drinking. That's why it's highly inebriating. Fermented wine. It's translated as new wine. Brother Arnold and I were talking briefly today, or a good little while today, and we made mention of how that the new wine, Brother Arnold verified what I was saying. He's probably studied it more than I have. The new wine, the, the fresh wine that is taken straight from the grapes because of the yeast that's on the skin of the grapes, it's the most intoxicating. Now, it's not necessarily the best. As Brother Arnold brought to my attention in Luke 5 where the Messiah was teaching, and he said, look, once people have gotten the taste of the old wine, they don't want to go back to the new wine because the old is better. That's, that's, <laughs> he's got that backwards. It's the new wine that's better. It's easier to drink, and you can drink more of it. It's not high in alcohol content. You don't start off with a high alcohol content and then it goes down. It builds up as it ferments. So that's that's logic. That's how it is easier to drink and, it, and it's sweeter. Once you get to the to you know fully fermented, it's no longer sweet wine. Now it has bitter aftertones, maybe has some flavors from the barrel or the jar or however it was stored, the wine skin. It will start taking on some of the tannins from uh, wherever it was stored. But initially, that first, that first batch that's, or, or, or period of it being fermented is actually the sweetest. That's where glucose comes from. It means sugar. But the new wine is the more inebriating or intoxicating of the wine. That makes sense, doesn't it? Because the men said they're drunk on new wine. Remember they heard them speak in all these languages? They're drunk on new wine. Why would they say new wine? Because it's highly inebriating. It's highly intoxicating. Okay? Now, the problem is, with this word, or the apparent problem, is that this is the only time the word glucose is used in the entire New Testament. When we're studying the Bible, one of the best ways to understand the meaning of a word deeper is to look at all of the places that the word is used in Scripture. And so we look up the word glucose and we hope that we find maybe 15 or 20 more references to the word in the New Testament. But you know what? You click on it there on my computer program and it pulls up Acts 2.13, the only use of the word in the entire New Testament. And so I wonder, well, how are we going to further validate the meaning of this word? I found when I opened up my Thayer's Greek lexicon that it referred me to Job 32 verse 19. Now you say Job 32 verse 19 is a Hebrew scripture, Brother Matthew, that is true. But it referred me to Job 32 19 in the Greek Septuagint. 
which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Now, I'll get to that in a second. First, we want to read it from the KJV, which is based on the Hebrew Masoretic text. It says in Job 32, 19, Behold, my belly is as wine which hath no vent. It is ready to burst like new bottles. The man that actually says this is a man named Elihu. He was one of the four men that came to visit Job, but he was the youngest of the four men. And he, in honor of the older men, allowed the three older men, he allowed them to speak to Job first. And he waited his turn in honor of the old age of those men. But he had to wait so long. I mean, we're already in the 32nd chapter of Job. And you read about all what these three men had said. And when it finally got his turn to speak, and he was upset at what the three men had told Job, and Elihu was probably the wisest of all four when you read what he said. He said, my belly is like wine that has no vent. I've been sitting here waiting for my turn, and I've had to wait through three different men, and they've been talking a lot. My belly feels like wine that doesn't have a vent. It's ready to burst like new bottles or like new wineskin. No, it's actually as new wineskins. There were no bottles. I need to point this out. There were no bottles in the time of Job. It's a very ancient times. Bottle, you can research this. Bottles weren't used until much later, more than, more than you know, almost you know, 1,500 years, 1,000 years, something like that. It, bottles were not used. It was wineskins. And this has been a this has been a translation problem before. New bottles, it's really new wineskins, right? They weren't worried if it in in modern times are they worried about new bottles bursting after they've been sealed? No, they're not. It's aging, and it it tends to keep its uh, its um, characteristics. Wineskins, on the other hand, where it, it, it can expand like a balloon. Right, can rupture, and that's why it has a vent on it. Now, the Holman Christian Standard Bible translates this word wine as unvented wine. Same thing as KJV wine, which has no vent. And what this seems like to me is a reference to new wine being placed into a wine skin with no vent. See, you have to have a vent to some degree on the wine skin so that the gases caused by fermentation can free their self little by little, else the skin may burst and the wine goes everywhere. Now we know the parable of the garment and the wine skins. No man puts new wine into old wine skins. Why? Because they're more worn out. But they put new wine into new wine skins. Why? Because of the elasticity. They have the ability to stretch. They're not worn out. They're new. However, even if you put new wine into a new wine skin, you have to allow it to be vented or else the gases will expand the wine skin to a certain point where it too will bust because the gases cannot bubble out little by little when the fermentation is taking place. So, this Hebrew word for wine is the word yayin. And in Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, it is from an unused root meaning to effervesce Wine as fermented by implication intoxication. It's translated in the KJV as. You know, you guys know what effervesce means? It means bubble. It's carbonated. It's, it's got, I mean, it's got some, some bubbles behind it. So it's a little kind of, it's like a Seagram's cooler. Like I just said, it's easier to drink it sweeter because it's still fermenting. It has that effervescence in it. The banqueting wine or wine bibber. It's definitely a word that refers to fermented alcoholic beverages. But I want you to notice how the Greek Septuagint translates this verse. In Job 32, 19, in the Greek Septuagint, Elihu says, and my belly is as a skin of sweet wine. You know what that word is? Glucose. Same word as in Acts 2, 13. He says it's bound up and ready to burst. I think that there can be no doubt that the reference that Elihu makes to glucose in Job is to new wine. He's talking about this fresh wine that's coming to the trough and it's placed into a new wine skin, but his belly's like putting that wine into a wine skin and not giving it a vent. 
the gases are bubbling, the fermentation gases are bubbling, and it's expanding, and it's expanding, and it's expanding. And, and eventually, you have the wine skin burst, and the wine is ruined, and the skin is ruined, etc., etc. This is how Elihu felt. And so if Pentecost was celebrated early in the third month in Acts chapter 2, this doesn't make sense. Acts 2.13 doesn't make sense. But if it's celebrated late in the fourth month, it makes complete sense. It makes perfect sense. The accusation. These men are drunk on new wine. And I think there's a reason why Yahuwah did not have it say, and ten days later, after Yeshua ascended to heaven, they were in the upper room. It doesn't say that. But you imply that in your beliefs because you're holding to a 50-day count. But when it says, it says when it was fully come, now it's open to the truth. Yahuwah made it ambiguous he made it obscure for a reason, because the very first one was defiled by Aaron and the people at the mount with the golden calf. And you who have hid it ever since that day. That's the thesis I'm going on, you guys. There has to be a reason why you who have hid it. It's obvious that he did. He's just like this persona of Jesus Christ that we get that comes in front of our Yeshua. The Catholic Church throws us a, a faint with this jesus christ persona and i'm t I, listen don't get upset with me i am talking about the two different personas we see in the messiah the catholic church version and the historical version of yeshua hamashiach the jewish man they call jesus it's two different people just like i have pointed out pentecost and shavuot are two different things pentecost cannot be shavuot because it does not fit the requirements of Shabbat. It's inserted. They left it obscure with a with a an obscure translation. Why why a Greek word in the English right here? Why not use the English word Shabbat or the Hebrew word in English Shabbat in the um what do you call it? <laughs> not analog, but um in a, not in a, I can't even think of the word now. But anyway, they use the word Pentecost. They don't have to do that. Why not just say it was the Feast of Weeks? Why not just say Shavuot? Why Pentecost and, and fixate us on this 50 thing? It's a feint. It's meant to confuse. And I believe you who have wanted it that way. But here's the thing. The, the disciples and, and, and Yeshua himself at that time had no problem with understanding this. They knew the cycle because it has not been had not been changed yet. That the, the calendar had not been changed until Constantine, you guys, at 322. This is 322 years after Yeshua. So they were on a lunar solar calendar at the at the time of Yeshua. It was an agricultural calendar. And that's what they were on. Peter doesn't say, You guys are crazy. There's no great harvest yet. No, he says, No, it's too early in the morning. So, let's move on to Exhibit G. I think this will be the last of them. John 4, verse 35. In John 4, verse 35, our Savior says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. And that's the King James Version. In the New American Standard Bible, he says, Do you not say there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest? Now, I want to read John chapter 4, beginning at verse 31. In the mean... While his disciples prayed him, urged him, asked him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Verse 33. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Yeshua saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Verse 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the feet. And, and let's be really clear here, uh, what, what Yeshua would say in context. He's saying this at the beginning of the barley harvest. Go and look at it. This, it's very clear. This is in the spring, early spring, just after the, the wheat has been planted. The spring wheat has been planted. It takes four months to get a harvest. And so by the time that Yeshua was saying this, if there would have been a field nearby and they could just look over, it would look like grass. It would be about four to six inches tall. <laughs> and that's a fact. 
And so it's absurd observation, Yeshua was saying, because he's clearly not talking about the wheat ready to be harvested. And he's sure not talking about barley because it's, we're talking about a different grain. This takes four months to harvest. And the period that he says that clearly puts barley out of the run for the grain he's speaking about. Another point. Fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. So there is no doubt in this. Clearly talking about men and clearly talking about the kingdom work, not talking about wheat at that point. This text that our Messiah, the son of Yahweh, is speaking spiritually here, but he's using something natural in order to get across a spiritual meaning. So in verse 35, it begins in the King James Version with, Say not ye. And I'm reading out of the 1611, so it might even be a little bit different than your King James Bible if, you, if you've got one there. The HCSB, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, translates this like this. Don't you say? Question mark. The New American Standard Bible translates it. Do you not say? Question mark. The point is this. Yeshua is not telling them something they don't say when he says, Say not ye. It's an interrogative. It's a question. Isn't this a common saying? Don't you guys say this question? In other words, of course you do. And he is telling them something they readily understand in the natural, something they know in the natural, in order to show them something in the spiritual. So it is readily acknowledged that both the barley and the wheat that can be planted in the fall and harvested in the spring takes about seven months to harvest. But what grain is Yeshua talking about here? He does mention it being white for harvest in verse 35. Now, Albert Barnes in his commentary on this text says this, quote, Grain, when ripe, turns from a green to a yellow or light color, indicating that it is time to reap it. And if we see this next picture I've got on the screen of the harvest-ready wheat, what we see is that it does have a light yellow to white color. This is the time when you harvest the wheat. Now, John Gill, in his commentary on this verse, John 4.35, he says this. Listen carefully. He says, some think that this does not refer to the then present time as if there were so many months from thence to the next harvest, but to a common way of speaking that there were four months from seed time to harvest, during which there was a comfortable hope and longing expectation of it. But this will by no means agree either with the wheat or the barley harvest. End of quote. What John Gill is saying in simplicity is this. There's two understandings of John 4.35. One is, is that the time that they're standing in, something's already been planted a few months back and there's four months left. Another understanding is this, is that Yeshua was giving them a common proverb that they knew. Don't you guys say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? In other words, isn't that something that's common to you? You plant and four months later you harvest? And I think that's what he's I just want to point out here that it's impossible to be something else that was planted so many times, so much further and there's only four months left. Because as I pointed out in the timing of the, the, the wedding, and the timing of John 4, when Yeshua says what he says, we are at Passover time. What's happening at Passover time? It's the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay, we're waving sheaves of barley. Wheat has nothing to do with, there's no wheat to be reckoned in that time. It's just been planted. And it hasn't been planted months before that. And, and we only got four months later. Uh, that would have been winter wheat planted into winter, and we, we got 240 days. How many, how many months is 120 days for spring wheat? You think Yeshua was talking about anything other than spring wheat at this point? No, he's not talking about something else that was planted a couple of months before, and we only got four months left. No, he is speaking specifically of the spring wheat, you guys. Period. 
You got to understand the, the grain. And please, if you do not understand the grain, stop making YouTube videos about it and trying to and, and trying to confuse the people and contradict what I'm telling you. I put many, many hours, many hours, three years of, of research into this subject. And I grew up much of my life around agriculture. I may not be an expert, you guys, and I'm, I'm, I'm not correct all the time in everything, but I got a pretty good grasp on this. I got a pretty good understanding on this, and I know it's impossible to have new wine and wheat in the third month. What's going on? He's saying, I do. It's something that's common. That, that's the point. Something you understand, I'm going to teach you something spiritual by it. Okay? John Gill doesn't think that that's the case. Why? Because the barley that's planted in the fall and the wheat that's planted in the fall or, or early winter take seven months to harvest. If he understood about spring wheat that's planted early spring and harvested in the summer, he would recognize that it took four months to harvest. Brother Arnold mentioned or reminded me today of a passage, I believe it's in John chapter 12, where Yeshua the Messiah likened himself to a grain of wheat that died and then produced a harvest later on down into the future. Well, we know that when our Savior died, it was at what time of the year? It was the springtime or what feast? Passover, unleavened bread, right? He died on the 14th day of Abib or the 14th day of Aviv. Well, if you calculate from there four months, you come to the end of the fourth month, not the beginning of the third month. The harvest of souls, the spiritual harvest, took place on Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. He likened himself to a grain of wheat that died. And how many months does it take to produce a harvest from a grain that dies in the ground and then produces? Four months. Not three or two and a half, but four. I think that's important. I do. I also think it's important. You can study. And again, you guys, kudos to Matthew. I mean, there, there are a couple of things that I disagree, obviously, with in this presentation, but otherwise, it's superb. I couldn't have said it. Matter of fact, he does say it better than me. He says it much better than me. But here you are, another witness. You got, I might be crude and, and whatever in my presentation. And, 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 you know, it may be that I'm lazy and I don't, you know, edit and put in all these, you know, graphics, but I don't have a time constraint, you guys. I got a lot going on. I'm now working with bees again, and, and I could barely get this teaching out <laughs> because of the time constraints. So I'm grateful for Matthew and his teaching. I can, I can springboard off of this and use him as a witness. He's presenting the same information to you guys. Please, I am imploring, begging some of you Zadok people to let go of your pride in your in your ego and research this and take a look at it. Come on and debate me. I would love for Peter Michael Martinez or uh, what's his name? Um, Tamar, uh, to, um, the guy that looks like Colonel Sanders. I can't think of his name, but he, you know who you are. Come and debate me. Let's talk about it. Let's hammer this thing out. But you guys won't do that. You want to continue with your, your absurd teachings and your absurd declarations of when the, the Shabbat is and when, like Yeshua was on a Saturday Shabbat. Th don't you know during the time of Yeshua, there was an eight-day week and Saturday was not the day you think it is today? How is that reconciled? How do you reconcile that? Because that's exactly what the Zadok calendar is. It's basically a glorified Gregarian. That's all it is, because you're keeping a Saturday Shabbat just like Judah. You're no different. No different. You're just as, as deceived as Judah. Study this in your, in your study time. Just try to follow along with me here on this next point. But if you look at the timetable, beginning in John chapter 2, and follow it through to John 4, it looks as if Yeshua is speaking John 4 during the time of unleavened bread, or the time of Passover. In John chapter 2, it mentions there was a feast of the Judahites, and it calls it Passover slash Feast of Unleavened Bread. 
In John chapter 7, we have John chapter 2, Passover. In John chapter 7, it mentions the Feast of Tabernacles. In John chapter 5, it mentions a Feast of the Judahites. But it doesn't name the Feast. Scholars debate what feast that is talking about. John 5 verse 1, it talks about the Feast of the Judahites. Some say Passover, some say Pentecost. It makes sense that it would be Pentecost because Passover is mentioned in John 2, Tabernacles, John 7, which one's in the middle? Pentecost. Well, did you know that in John 5, at that feast of the Judahites, that was the story or the account of the man that had been lame for 38 years and the angel would come down and stir up the pool there at Bethesda, but he didn't have anybody to pick him up and put him into the pool. But one day, the Savior passed by, and he didn't need to be put in the pool. <laughs> the Savior touched him, and he was healed 38 years. And it says that day was the Sabbath day. If that is the Feast of Pentecost, which is very likely, it says it fell on the Sabbath day. The traditional third month of Pentecost falls on the day after the seventh Sabbath, not on the Sabbath. The one that's calculated in the fourth month falls on either the Sabbath, or as we'll see here shortly, or the day of the new moon, the fifth new moon. So I think that if you can put all that together, I know that's a lot of information, I think what we're seeing is, is that there is much information and evidence that is heavy in favor of the later Pentecost than there is of the earlier one. So let's recap. Point number one, in Exodus 19 verse 1, it shows that Israel came to the wilderness of Sinai in the middle of the third month, either the 15th or 16th day of the third month. Number two, in Exodus 24, 12, 31, 18, and Deuteronomy 9, 11, they all show that the law was given to Moses at the end of his 40 days in the mount, not at the beginning. Not at the beginning of the third month, but at the end of his 40 days in the mount when he was fasting, not eating any food, or the Bible says, not drinking any water. It was very miraculous. Uh, point number three, Exodus 32, verse 5, Aaron, the high priest, who was commanded to proclaim the hogs, the feasts, he proclaims this hog late in the fourth month, not early in the third month. As a matter of fact, you will find no place in Scripture where the word hog is related to anything in the third month. But here we do find it related to the fourth month, the word Chag. And it just so happens that it's 50 days after the seventh Sabbath when counting from the 16th of Abib. Point number four, Exodus 32, verse 38. That's another typo by me. Acts 2, verse 41. These parallel with 3,000 souls. Remember the very first Pentecost that was ever kept? 3,000 souls were destroyed. Take your sword kill your family, they didn't want to come to Yahweh's side, the first Pentecost after Yeshua went to heaven, 3,000 souls were saved. The one in Exodus, the law was written on tablets of stone. The one in Acts 2, the law was written on the tables of the heart. You see the parallels? There comes a time, Brother Arnold likes to say, when coincidences stop and facts begin. Point number five, there does exist a wheat harvest in Scripture that takes place when the grapes are being tread and even the olive harvest begins, the early olive harvest. And I would encourage you that if you get a chance to talk to Brother Arnold, you need to do so because he can go into a lot more than I can as it pertains to the wheat harvest in the Bible. Point number six, Acts 2.13 and Job 32.19 show that there was new wine available at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. It's not possible in early in the third month but it is late in the fourth, early fifth. And point number seven, John 4.35 has Yeshua mentioning a grain that is white, ready for harvest in four months. This must be spring wheat harvested in the summer. So let me go through some final thoughts here. Please take into consideration the level of biblical truth that was just proven to you with Scripture. And we didn't have to go outside the Bible not one time. I am so tired of hearing people cite Jubilees like it's scripture. Guys, it's fun to read. It's really cool to glean from. But to set doctrine and to hold it over scripture is foolishness. Stop doing that. Stop bringing me Jubilees because there's 28 contradictions. A book can contradicts itself and it contradicts the Bible. That would be, listen, it would be like me taking the Talmud 
and disproving the New Testament. That's how abs absurd that is. Okay, it, you, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. And you'll never see me, I, we can read it. And I love reading Enoch, even though I think Enoch 2 and 3 is, is tampered with. But you got to know this, not one example, complete example of Jubilees was found in Qumran. All they have ever found are fragments. No completed uh, editions of, of, of Jubilees. Go research that. There are no intact Jubilees that come out of Qumran. So stop saying it's, the Qumran, it's what they had in Qumran. And that they were Zadoks over there. No, they weren't. You will not find that name anywhere. I mean, the word means righteous. But yeah, there were many righteous men in that time. But there they, they was not a sect called the Zadokim. No. There was not. It is a made-up name here in the end days. And it's really funny to me how their Shabbat coincides with the Hillel calendar and, and Judah. Even though they might celebrate their feast differently, they're still keeping the Shabbat on Saturday, you guys. Yeshua did not keep Saturday as a Shabbat. His father made the clock. You guys, that's all I got in, in this video. I don't, I don't, I think he just has some concluding thoughts. Uh, go and watch the complete video, actually. I'll, I'll put it down in the description. But for sake of time, I'm going to conclude it right here. I think we've proven the point, even though I know I'm not done with this topic. There are still going to be people thumbing their nose at me saying, Jonathan's under, you know, judgment. What is he, you know, what, whatever, whatever you want to say. Go about your business. But I'm not going to stop teaching this because I know the importance. I know the importance. The reason why the spirit was poured out in the in the upper room at this time is because they had the day right and they were in one mind and one accord. That's not going to happen again until we get to that point. And you guys, I got to be quite frank with, I cannot see the Hebrew groups coming in unity. I can't see it. It would truly be a miracle for you to unite the basically five or six ways I've seen the Shabbat being kept, the feast being kept, and all of these groups are called Hebrews because it's not Christians. You got, we're not talking about Christians at all. That's not who you, who is going to pour out his spirit on. When he talks about all flesh, that's in the Hebrew camp. He's not talking about all flesh, like the wicked too. Don't misunderstand what, what King James is telling you there. He's, he's talking about Israel, all flesh in Israel. Hebrews that are not the state of Israel. Again, don't misunderstand. I know I've got some people that, the state of it? No, we are Israel. Hebrews, the diaspora that's in the world. The crossed over, that word means to cross over. Does not mean Jew. Okay, so got to get it right with some of the, the terms, some of the terminology, the understanding, the Hebraic understanding, the agricultural um, uh, understanding of the Bible. Otherwise, you're going to come away with a completely left field understanding of what Scripture is actually saying, you guys. And Yahuwah obviously allowed this to happen. He allowed his name to be obscured. He allowed that his feast would be hidden. He allowed that the Shabbat would be tampered with. He's revealing that in the last days for a reason. You got that last day remnant is special. He's gonna he's he's gonna do amazing things through the remnant. Keep your head up. Shalom to you, you guys. Shavuot is still to come. It's next new moon, so we still got about a roughly about a month before Shavuot time, the true Shavuot. And if you celebrated Pentecost, observe that day as well. If you don't do anything but wave a couple of loaves and say, thank you, Father, what is it going to hurt you? It won't. I guarantee you it's a special day, and you will hit it for a reason. That's why there's no moon. Shalom to you. May you will bless you. Make his face shine upon you. And keep you safe. See you next video.